All right, well, the webinar is being recorded in its entirety. Uh, it will also be live streamed on TVW beginning at 2.15 today. 2.15 is whenever the Washington and the regional portion of the webinar will begin. If you have questions for the speakers, please put them in the Q&A section, which is on your Zoom toolbar, it says Q&A, um, and that is where we will be reading the questions for any speakers. Uh, if you have like technical difficulties, uh, that's when you use the chat, but any questions, please utilize the Q&A. The Washington State Department of Agriculture has awarded two recertification credits for pesticides holders. Um, you have to be present for the entire webinar in order to receive these credits. And we will be putting out a code word at some point throughout the webinar. So only those um, who stay and then put the code word and the license number in the chat will uh, be awarded that uh, will be awarded that credit. And if you have technical difficulties, um, you can just use the same link to log back in. So you just go to that same link that you have saved for this webinar. There's also a phone number that you can call in and at least get the content that way. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Blaine Reeves. Uh, Blaine Reeves is with the Department of Natural Resources and he is the chair for the Washington Invasive Species Council. And he's gonna provide some opening remarks. So over to you, Blaine. Thank you very much, Maria. I, I assume you can hear me? Yes. Perfect. Well, good afternoon and, and thank you all of you for joining us today. Um, as Maria said, my name is Blaine Reeves. I'm the current chair of the Washington, Washington State Invasive Species Council. It's my honor today, along with my longtime colleague, Greg Hobrick from the Washington State Department of Agriculture to welcome you to this Washington State Spotted Lanternfly Action Plan webinar. <clears throat> the Washington Invasive Species Council as many of you know, was established by the legislature first in 2006 and recently extended through 2032. And the purpose of the, the council is to bring together all the state agencies that have a role in invasive species, as well as tribal nations, federal and local agencies, industry and conservation partners. Um, and, and really to, to provide policy level direction, planning and coordination for com combating harmful invasive species throughout the state and preventing the introduction of others that aren't here yet um, and may be harmful. So we're here today to cooperatively prepare for and mitigate the effects of a plant health emergency in, in Washington state, the spotter and lanternfly. Though it's not here yet, the spotter and lan lanternfly is an invasive insect that has the potential for dramatic negative impacts in Washington's environment, on its economy, on its agricultural crops, um, it's as, as most of you or many of you are, are more aware than me, it was, it's native to Asia. It was first found in North America in, in Pennsylvania in 2014. I believe that since then it's reproduced quickly. It's, it's began sweeping across the continent. Um, it's dangerous because it feeds on sap from a wide variety and a wide range of trees, crops, and other plants. Um, it's feeding activity weakens plants and can result in plant disease and death. Plants that may be affected include grapes, apples, hops, pine, and hardwood trees, and many others. Um, today, we're going to hear about the spotted lanternfly and, and Washington State's uh, draft action plan to prepare for this pest, both before and after it arrives in Washington. And we're also fortunate to hear about, or we'll hear hear from APHIS on on the nation or the national response plan and some specific. Uh, uh, plans that are have been developed and implemented in North Carolina, California, and in British Columbia. Um, you know, one of the one of the most one of the, the the Washington Invasive Species Council's functions is uniting organizations to solve com common problems. And you know, this is a this is a great example. I'm I'm really excited to to have this opportunity to to come together today to introduce our draft plan and to hear hear from any of you and all of you what we can do better in it as we as we move to finalize it. Um, seriously, for a threat this scope, we, we actually need a, a united effort and we need people from from all over joining together. So thank you for for joining us here today. I'm going to turn it over to, like I said, a longtime colleague, Greg Hobrick, who I first worked with 
in the mid 90s on on Spartina and Purple Loose Drive. Greg's going to talk to us a little bit about agriculture's interest in this. So, Greg, please take it over. Hey, thanks, Blaine. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, the good news today is uh, my video is not functioning, so you don't have to look at me. Uh, that's good. And yeah, Blaine, I didn't know you were that old, uh, really, back in the 90s, huh? <laughs> anyway, thanks, Blaine. You're as eloquent as always. And um, I'd like to uh, also thank uh, Justin Bush and the Invasive Species Council and all of his staff there for hosting this uh, webinar and for all the work they've done uh, over the years. I don't know. I suppose most of you know by now Justin Bush is going to be doing some other things. He's moving off to another position. Uh, Justin and I go way back uh, as well, uh, back to his days in the Skamania County we board. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you guys for doing this. And while I'm thanking agencies, I'd like to thank all the participating agencies for their work uh, that they've done uh, on this plan, developing this plan. And uh, there's a lot of folks that, that have been involved. And uh, I think it's been a really good example of collaboration and cooperation. And, and um, again, uh, hats off to WISC for kind of organizing all this. Um, as far as the pest that we're going to talk about today, I think some people maybe are perhaps suffering a little bit from the crisis of the day syndrome. Um, there's always something going on. And um, with our program, uh, the pest program, we um, deal with pests on a daily basis. And, you know, whether it's spongy moth or northern giant hornet or sudden oak death or whatever the pest happens to be, uh, they're bad. And we tell people they're bad. And again, I think people kind of eh, at some point maybe think we're crying wolf a little bit. But in the case of spotted lanternfly, that's definitely, definitely not the case. Um, when this one gets here, it will be an actual crisis for the ag industry and natural resource agencies, very likely. Um, so again, um, I'm, glad, I'm happy this, uh, this webinar is taking place. I think it's great to get out there and educate folks and let you know what's going on. And uh, again, thanks for, to all the agencies for working on this plan so that we'll be, we'll be more uh, ready uh, when it does arrive. And with that, I will, hand it back to you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg and Blaine. All right. Well, I am very excited to introduce our first speaker this afternoon. Uh, we have Matthew Travis with us, and he is a Spotted Lanternfly National Policy Manager um, for the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant, Health Inspection Services at Plant Protection Quarantine. And Matthew's gonna be talking to us today a little bit about the nationwide perspective and some work that's being done at his office. So I'll turn it over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Maria, I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I appreciate the time and the opportunity to come here and uh, talk to you about the spotted lanternfly, obviously from a national perspective and uh, uh, just uh, really welcome the uh, participation and the collaboration, the opportunity to work with uh, uh, Washington and the Species Council, as well as the Washington State Department of Agriculture. And uh, that's how we best, I feel, approach some of these uh, more challenging subjects is through collaboration and uh, cooperation. And so this is a, a great opportunity to share with you. So uh, give me a second. I'm going to be sharing my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes, looks great. All right, thanks. So as Maria said, um, my name is Matt Travis. I'm Spotted Lanternfly National Policy Manager and I work for USDA APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine. So let's dive right in and, and look at uh, just a quick background in history. I'm sure many of you are aware of it and know of it. Uh, first detected in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. And since then, it's expanded to 14 states in total. Um, it's important to make note that as we speak about the 14 states, that these 
this is not an infestation of the entire state. Even in Pennsylvania, it's not entirely infested. Not every county has spotted lanternfly. And I think that's an important distinction because a lot of times I know people believe that it's just moving so rapidly across the U.S. And certainly I will agree that it is moving quite quickly. But there's a lot of work and effort being done by both uh, the states and by APHIS PPQ to try and minimize and reduce and limit the spread of spotted lanternfly. And, and I'd say to some level, there is success. And so we have stopped it from just sweeping across the country and, and really taking off, I think, which would, would have occurred had we done nothing or nothing would be happening at the state or federal level. It's been you know, spread mostly through na through human assisted spread. Uh, it does spread naturally, but human assisted spread is really uh, the way that this has uh, made it so far so quickly. And it's really using our transportation corridors and pathways to to move so quickly across the United States to make large jumps from one state to the next. And so that's really the way we we focused on it is through the human assisted spread aspect and look at transportation, very focused at transportation, looking at how it can make those long distance jumps from one place to the next. As many of you know, primary host is Tree of Heaven, Alanthus altissima, although it can uh, use other plant hosts. And there are certainly has been research and science to show that it can complete its life cycle on other hosts. It really, Alanthus seems to be the, the ideal host and, and allows the insect to continue to produce the future generations. And currently, you know, it's it's a question, I say unlikely, but it's really a question of whether or not in some areas we're ever gonna be truly able to eradicate uh, this insect from some of the more established sections or and areas, uh, being that it's, it's so heavily populated. I do believe we can manage and control it and reduce it, but it's gonna take time. And it's just one of the things with an invasive species and this kind of a challenge, it's gonna take time. And so if you, as you look at this slide, you'll see that it's gonna slowly start to populate and build just to give you an idea and a sense of how this has started, has spread over the, the last nine years, um, quickly starting of course in Pennsylvania and then spreading out to the adjacent states. And then certainly as this builds, you can see it starting to jump up into the Northeast, to the South, and into the West, in the Midwest, out to Ohio, Indiana, and finally up into Michigan. And so, you know, we face some challenges with this program, certainly from a national perspective and, and from the state perspective, I'm sure, you know, there've been a lot of challenges, a lot of different challenges. Again, it's expanded fairly rapidly uh, from going from one single state to 14 states into about eight or nine years. Um, we only have two states where all counties have spotted lanternfly. That's New Jersey and Delaware right now. But as I said, you know, a lot of hard work's been put into it, and it has had some results. Um, at the same time, as this insect has expanded at the federal and state level, we we've lacked the resources needed to really address this fully, really go after this insect, um, and so we've challenged with restraints or constraints on our funding and our resources to be able to keep pace with this insect. And so that's been a challenge. Certainly we lack an effective lure. That's been a challenge. We don't have a, an attractant for this insect. We have a trap, the circle trap, but we don't have an effective lure like we do for, for some of our pests of some of our invasives. Uh, so we don't really have an effective way to pull the, the insect into the traps that we're deploying out into the field. Certainly a single generation, that, that doesn't seem like a big challenge, but when it comes to research, having one generation per year, that can have its limitations. And certainly uh, we've seen that. Again, it has a wide diverse host range, you know, well over a hundred different hosts have been documented now um, that it's fed on. And then it has again, multiple diverse pathways that it's been moving. It's been using human assisted spread and transportation corridors to really move from uh, its origin in, in the US to areas uh, far and abroad. Certainly regulatory authority of different states has been, a con has been an issue, has been a challenge for some states, having the authority to treat, having the authority to access properties, to do treatments on those properties has presented some challenges in being able to respond and address 
uh, spotted lanternfly throughout the U.S. The National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act both have presented some challenges in allowing us at the federal level to be able to support the response of several states uh, that have found spotted lanternfly. And those are really the environmental aspects of the treatments that we do and the work that we do in the field. And those have a process that we have to work through that we must comply with as a federal agency. And that's taken time and that's limited and delayed some of the response uh, in some of the states that, that spotted lanternfly has been found, where it has been found. Certainly finding and implementing a biological control is a long-term goal. It's, it's something that we know is gonna be important. It's gonna be important for the future, but developing those biological controls are never quick, never fast, never easy. And it's not something we simply can do a few studies with or a, a year or two of research and then quickly deploy into the field. And so while we're hopeful and we have some good candidates, some good uh, tools in the biological control toolbox, it's, it's gonna take us time to get there um, to be able to deploy those tools and, and get that out there to be able to use those effectively in the field. So currently the Spotted Lanternfly Program has uh, really six goals. And, and, and I'm just gonna go over these briefly, but really we're looking to suppress and reduce the overall population and limit the advancement of spotted lanternfly. And so we're focused our primary control measures based on our data, based on what research and science and our data has told us to address the infested areas and established populations. We're really focusing our control measures on high risk transportation and commodity pathways to try and minimize the risk of long distance dispersal. We're looking at rapid response and control strategies, especially in small satellite populations when they're discovered, because we think that's the best opportunity that we have to potentially eradicate if that's a possibility. We certainly wanna promote and continue to promote harmonized and implementation of best management practices, uh, not just for states, but for individual industries, businesses, and for growers to address the, the risk of long distance movement. We continue to look to harmonize state regulatory and data collection activities across the program, and then maximize the education man and management recommendations and citizen reporting by supporting robust outreach strategies nationwide. So let's just break the program down real quickly uh, into these five areas, prediction, research, detection, treatment, and outreach. So we continue to use and develop and modify our pathway and predictive modeling. This helps us try and understand how this is moving, look at our high-risk pathways, identify our high-risk pathways for natural and human-assisted spread, and then generate high-risk pathways beyond our known populations. And that helps us inform our state partners, our regional partners, our industries, areas of risk. Where can we expect spotted lanternfly to show up based on the pathways and the data that we have, the information and knowledge that we've collected, and how does that feed the model? Likewise, we use uh, predictive mapping, generating in an interactive maps with different progressing zones of prediction and cumulative uh, egg hatch potential. And then we, we look at maps of molt and adults as the insect uh, continues to develop. And so here's just some examples of uh, some of the um, different methods or different forecasting models that we've used. I'm sure many of them are familiar to you. We have PESCAST, which of course is uh, APHIS's model, which shows degree day development. And it's something that we use uh, to forecast uh, the life stages. If spotted lanternfly is present in certain areas or states, we use this to predict when people could potentially see the first nymph emergence, when they could start seeing the adults. And so this helps people when it comes to survey and monitoring to kind of have an idea what, what to be looking for when they're out in the field. Likewise, to help inform the public of what they could be looking for uh, if they're out there looking uh, during their normal daily routines. Certainly, some of you are probably familiar with the iEco Lab uh, forecast and model. This comes from Temple University in a collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Matt Helmus and his lab. And so this helps us identify, and this was a, a model first started and developed in Pennsylvania, and this helps identify 
various sites uh, and uses and, and industries, and then assigns them uh, a risk value based on uh, many, many factors, uh, certainly movement, uh, dispersal, uh, looking at the area spotted lanternfly is known to be in. So it's looking at a lot of different factors and then evaluating those sites, those industries on a risk basis. Certainly main areas of research are very uh, important for the spotted lanternfly program. And it kind of breaks it down into research into the biology of spotted lanternfly, into the survey and trapping tools that we have for spotted lanternfly, the treatments that we've been developing for spotted lanternfly, of course, biological control pathway and predictive modeling is all pieces of, of research in the areas of research that we have continued to work with uh, as the program has started. So looking at uh, certainly the science of spotted lanternfly research is continuing and ongoing. Again, treatment, all research areas are, are advancing with results being shared and published. We work with about 19 separate institutions and right now average about 51 researchers uh, with different research projects that we are funding both through PPA 7721 and of course through allocated or research dollars uh, appropriated through line item funds. So looking at survey and trapping, certainly uh, the initial focus is and has been the tree of heaven. Uh, we also look at other hosts on which spotted lanternfly has been observed feeding on. And so use of traps on other species other than tree of heaven. And we've expanded that over time to be able to use different tree species or different plant species to deploy our circle trap, which you see there on the image on the far right. In the center, you see the bug barrier with the white batting. And then on the left is the sticky band, which the program has really uh, moved away from because we were having bycatch issues, issues with other uh, non-target species getting caught on this sticky band. And so we've really, at, at the field level, we've, we've walked away and stepped away from using these uh, within the program just because they presented that challenge to us. Certainly life stage and uh, life cycle observations, we continue to look and research those things, work with collaborators to research those things. Again, progressing from the original sticky bands, looking at host volatiles and insect volatiles continues to be a line of research that we have continued to look at, trying to find that, that ever elusive attractant for the spotted lanternfly. And then finally, looking at visual and acoustic cues for the spotted lanternfly. Again, trying to understand the behavior of spotted lanternfly and really what do they key in on when it comes to visual cues or acoustic cues, which, which we know is part of their behavior. Um, we're just trying to understand how we can best utilize that to uh, make a survey and monitoring and survey and trapping uh, very efficient. Certainly with survey and trap trapping, we've also worked with collaborators as well as our own, within our own program to develop uh, detector canines for spotted lanternfly egg mass detection. Uh, we have two teams deployed currently in North Carolina. Um, likewise, through collaboration, uh, Pennsylvania has a team through, through PennVet. And then uh, New Jersey, New York also uses their conservation dogs uh, in their parks and natural areas. Uh, again, for uh, detection of spotted lanternfly by detecting their egg masses. I've got five minutes left, Matthew. Okay, thank you. Um, looking at program focus, again, we're looking at high-risk pathways, really focusing on rail and different transit methods, high-risk industries, and high-value agricultural commodities. Treatment, we've, we're conducting a lot of different treatments. Golden pest spray oil certainly has egg mass treatments by Fenton as a contact spray. And we've been working with our researchers to develop the best tools available, but these are the tools that we have and are currently deploying in the field uh, throughout the 14 states. Certainly we uh, continue to look at the adult phenology, looking at the different life stages of the insect. Again, looking at it as a targeting strategy and tactic, when to best approach, uh, these different life stages for the different treatments that we have available, and we continue to develop that over time. Again, biological control, many different types of tools that we're looking at, certainly parasitoids, 
uh, entomopathogens and verticillium wilt for the tree of heaven are areas that we continue to work with and research. We continue to uh, work in terms of outreach and education, uh, different uh, looking at different audiences, both state, uh, industry, and the general public. We continue to work with our partners to develop and communicate uh, the message to all these parties, uh, not just the industry and states, but also to the general public. As we found, the general public really is a great ally when we educate them and make them knowledgeable about spotted lanternfly and what to be uh, looking for when they're out there. Finally, I'll just talk about the strategic plan. We have a national strategic plan that we've been working on for some time. We will be releasing it very soon nationally to the National Plant Board and to NASDA and the National Association of States Department of Agriculture. Uh, we gave a webinar to our tribes this past week, last week, and we'll be looking, we're looking for feedback from them, but we will be kicking that off very soon. And this is generally the goals, the strategic goal for the next five years, and then the separate goals under that strategy. Finally, just the environmental assessment, we're really looking at a programmatic environmental assessment, which will uh, provide an opportunity for us to help respond to spotted lanternfly in new states. And this will help us uh, develop that environmental assessment to help mitigate any environmental impacts that any of our treatments or work in the field may do. As long as it's federally funded, we, may, we have to comply again with NEPA and ESA and the environmental assessment will have us help us do that. And with that, I'll take any questions if there are any. But any. Again, I'll thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the time and uh, opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. I know you're really busy. So thank you so much for taking time to, to speak with us today. Um, questions for Matthew, please put them in the Q&A. Well, I was wondering about your outreach and if you have any uh, specific methods that you think are more successful than others. Yeah, Maria, I would say definitely, I mean, social media has definitely been the platform of choice. It is uh, something that we have really seen success with getting that message out, not just at a national level with, with APHIS PPQ and legislative public affairs, uh, we've worked and targeted certain regions at certain times based on the life cycle of the insect. And okay. so we've been able to use um, social media and getting getting it out as targeted ads and, and communication out with social media during those specific times of year. So that's certainly something that we've seen a lot of success with. With the national strategy, uh, APHIS is committed to going to the large industries at the corporate headquarters at the at the top tier at the top level of management with both our rail and transportation industries especially we certainly are going to continue to work with the nursery industry because we feel it's very important um, but we're going to look at those pathways and really work to target and focus our our national uh, outreach campaigns at those industries specifically that we see as possibly uh, dispersing spotted lanternfly even further. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple questions for you in the Q&A. So the first one says, we have been actively mapping Tree of Heaven in Southern British Columbia on the border with Washington State. How do we join forces across the border? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so we, we maintain uh, a database which we do share uh, with, especially in some of the, the work and surveys that we do. Um, we are currently in a, a cross kind of cross-border uh, conversation with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Um, and we are talking about best practices and how we can share, better share data, uh, both you know, United US data as well as uh, data in Canada at large. Um, that is something that we certainly want to continue, especially as we have detections or if there are any detections across the border, we'll continue to uh, have those conversations. So I'd say right now, um, we can talk further about it, but we do keep, um, we do keep uh, pretty good records and data keeping to be able to share that information 
uh, with various uh, agencies and groups. Great. Um, what amount of federal resources, i.e. funding, have been devoted to tracking and eradicating the spotted lanternfly? How close to actual need to implement the strategy? Sure. So with the strategy, with the national strategy that I mentioned, we, we went as far as saying that 80% of our appropriated dollars within APHIS is going to be focused just on implementation and response. 80% uh, of our appropriated dollars, you're looking at close to 11, between 11 and $12 million uh, annually or fiscally. Um, so we are committed to spending that or focusing that amount of dollars uh, at that specific uh, goal. Uh, the research aspect, we're uh, committing 15% of our overall appropriations to continue research because we really think research are going to help us uh, give us the best tools for not just now, but in the future. So that's something that we're going to continue to do. Um, and then 5% uh, for outreach, and that's at the federal level. That does not include, and I want to make this clear, that is not included. Uh, Farm Bill or PPA 7721 funding. When I talk about 80% uh, or 15% or 5%, that's just line item appropriations that APHIS gets, that PPQ gets for specialty crops that cover spotted lanternfly activities. And that's everything. So that 100%, uh, that, that is only appropriated dollars. That is not PPA 7721. So there's a lot of opportunity to continue to survey um, and look for spotted lanternfly. Certainly, I know we're going to be making more dollars available to our tribal partners as well uh, going forward for 2024. And we look to continue, hopefully, to find more resources to be able to support uh, the field activities going on. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. So thank you so much again, Matthew. That was excellent. Thank we really you. appreciate having Thanks. you. Yes. Okay. Next up, uh, we have speakers from the East Coast, from North Carolina with us today. And we have Joy Goforth, Paul Adams, and Amy Michael. And they are from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And they're going to be talking to us about their response uh, to the spotted lantern fly in their state. All right, just checking to make sure everybody can see uh, my presentation clearly. Yes. All right. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I will say the three hour time difference threw us uh, and I was asked to present just some information about why our program, um, how we got to where we are and why I feel like our program has been successful as well as highlight some issues. And to do that in 15 minutes um, with time for questions is almost impossible. So I'm going to really fly through information um, really quickly, uh, Paul Adams is our regulatory entomologist. He's on as well to correct me as well as um, chime in if uh, if I um, not only if I get anything wrong, but to help answer questions at the end. And uh, as well as Amy Michael, who is our CAPS coordinator, and both of them really are not only responsible for good portions of this presentation, but also uh, for the success of the program, um, or I should say, moreover, for the success of the program, their literal blood, sweat, and tears, along with our staff, USDA, who assisted, um, and then uh, our North Carolina Forest Service as well, who really who really dug in to make this last year um, something that we we can can celebrate as much as we can celebrate an infestation. So um, you just kind of highlighting on on some of what we already discussed is kind of where do we begin? And um, you know, outreach from the from the get go is incredibly important. Um, long before spotted lantern fly ever gets to uh, gets to your state. Matt was absolutely right, and we just, um, Amy found a pathway for us to uh, to be able to utilize social media this year. That's something we haven't done in the past, and that was unbelievably successful. It was targeted in a very specific area to a very specific group through Facebook, and we found that to be incredibly successful, but the see it, snap it, report it message is something that we have used regularly or from the very beginning. We um, did use this like we have much of what, what we have in our arsenal, which is We've stolen it from another state with their permission. Pennsylvania had to see it, stomp it, or see it, smash it, report it. Uh, our message was a little different. Um, we developed a QR code immediately. 
uh, to go with that. So some, anybody can click on it and get to our website to get more information. And then a couple of lessons that we learned. Uh, the first is that the, um, the lovely um, big flag on the left, I love them, got so excited. They're about 13 feet tall. What gets your message out there um, better than a giant flag? But they are a huge pain and ended up not being one of our best outreach tools. But the idea is great. And we're going to continue on with something similar, but the flags were just a bad idea. We also initially had a bad bug at ncagr.gov. Uh, email. And that's what we said is, you know, report it to this web address. And we thought that was catchy and that um, people would remember it. And they did. And that was great. But we would just get really vague reports that were impossible to follow up on. So we changed that to an online reporting mechanism at, um, at our ncagr.gov backslash SLF website. And we'll talk more about that later. But we still do get some reports at the bad bug email. Um, still catchy, still works, just doesn't, you know, doesn't collect everything we need. Another tool that we had was, and again, this is where if you go to that ncagr.gov backslash SLF, this is where you land. Um, there's a good bit more information on that page, but I wanted you to see how easy it is for someone to get to our landing page and re report the spotted lanternfly. Um, that information is auto-generated. We, of course, collect all their contact information and require that they submit a picture. We found that to be incredibly helpful. Also, uh, so many of our reports came in. People are confident they've seen it, but can't provide any level of proof. Uh, and then on the right is a document that was created from all the false reports that were received, which is wonderful to get a false report. It means people are looking um, and um, it also means we don't have another spotted lantern fly infestation. So, you know, both of those are, are, are good problems to have. But when relying on citizen scientists to report uh, because spotted lantern fly, it looks vastly different in all of its life stages and citizens in general don't understand when they might see which life stage we tend to get these false reports kind of year round every time they find something that looks in general like it. But we always thank them for the reports and move along. Um, another thing I can't stress enough that we learn from from other states and we've learned ourselves somewhat the hard way is anything you can do to um, in advance plan for some level of automation. So again, you know, initially we were responding that bad bug email, someone would have to type a response to every one of those. And now when you hit um, submit on your report, you get an auto generated email thanking them and saying, if it's spotted lanternfly, you'll hear back from us. If you don't hear back from us, contact extension and they'll help you identify your insect. Um, we still respond to most of them, but it does help a lot whenever we're in our super busy stages and just don't have time to respond to all. We also um, have developed a plan. It is not in place. We do not plan on permitting ourselves unless other states require it. So we have um, we have begun the development of a um, an automated permitting system so that uh, it's not eating up the resources we have in our office managing that end of things. Um, quickest overview uh, and why I consider our program especially successful. It was June 23rd of 2022 when we had our report. We came in around 11 or so. We already knew every report we got. We deployed staff immediately. So by lunchtime, we had two staff that had driven a couple hours and called and said, it's here, it's here. And it was here in droves and it was a much heavier infestation than we planned. That was a Thursday. And by Tuesday, June 28th, we were in the field and we were um, actively treating. We had everything we needed to begin getting homeowner acknowledgements and begin um, treatment of trees. And I'll kind of go over the treatment um, very briefly here in just a short period of time. Uh, and then the remainder of the timeline, we, of course, um, followed through September 20th was our first, uh, the first time we saw um, an egg mass being laid. And then in October, the trees began to senesce and things were slowing down. So we stopped our treatment program this year. I'm not going to read through all of this, but, you know, this is just really the, the one slide that encapsulates how much we accomplished in a very, very hot, very tiring summer. The, of course, you should probably plan for this. Um, it wasn't the spotted lanternfly find wasn't exactly where we thought it was going to be. It wasn't an area that we were looking hard and um, as it, as luck would have it, it isn't an area that was particularly convenient to anyone. So um, we were driving about two hours to get in there and treat. But again, you can read there, we had um, a huge amount of success with our survey and our treatments just in that area where we knew spotted lanternfly to be. And as Matt um, 
alluded to for the nationwide goal, you know, we're doing everything we can to um, to eradicate, but when that's not possible, um, suppression is, is our goal. Uh, early detection and rapid response is how we have planned from the very beginning, and that is still our goal. The day we get a report, someone follows up um, within, usually within that day, but certainly within 24 hours. Um, we have been surveying for many years using um, federal dollars and then some, some of our own as well. All of our staff is trained to look for this pest. Um, we, uh, of course, uh, utilized ArcGIS for our mapping and then backpack sprayers for our treatments. Um, and, uh, and again, I can go over the treatment, but that's kind of getting into the woods of things. And what you guys want to know is how to plan. Um, and so Matt talked some about funding. Make sure you know in advance where your money's coming from. Make sure the products that you want to use are labeled for your state. Uh, that can be a, a big hurdle for you. Determine who on your staff can apply pesticides if you're going to utilize your staff to do that. Some states do, some states don't. We found that was the only way for us to be able to respond quickly. Um, we actually hit a little bit of a hurdle that our process to gain access on private land wasn't um, wasn't quite what we thought it was initially. Uh, and so we had to work through a couple kinks there, but that all came out really smoothly. And fortunately, we've had almost very, very little opposition to us coming and, and treating um, private properties for spotted lanternfly. Um, we, as we talked about our reporting mechanism, and then we had, we have a GIS analyst on staff who um, we had our mapping system ready to go. And every single day we were evaluating our processes and our mapping and our, you know, we, we would stop each day and try to figure out how to do things better the next day. Uh, and so it was, it was very much a fluid process as we jumped into our infestation. So we had a foundation, knew what we were doing, had a wonderful jumping off point, but we also knew we were going to have to iron out some wrinkles as we went along and, and that happened. And it was, um, uh, by the end of the season, we felt like it'd been a great learning opportunity, maybe not a fun one, but it was a, it was a good learning opportunity. Um, we did develop an SLF response plan that was really more about kind of walking into a, um, a small population and responding quickly. And instead we were kind of dropped into the raging inferno of a infestation that had been there two or three years, uh, um, we're estimating. And so our response plan, even though it helped us plan to get where we were and have everything we needed, um, really where we jumped in was far beyond the beginning of the, kind of the end of this, the response plan, but that was okay too. Um, we already had our chemicals and our sprayers, all our supplies, purchased and at the ready and had them stored for when we received the call that we got. Um, we spent a lot of time asking other states what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Uh, and, um, and both of those answers were equally as important. What do you wish you'd known that you wish somebody had told you or what did you what have you, you know, been doing that you feel isn't working or has room for improvement? Um, we did send um, almost all of our staff that is has worked on the spotted lanternfly program, went to Pennsylvania for training. I cannot thank Pennsylvania and other cooperating states enough for just being transparent and letting us be a part of their program. And I highly encourage that for all states to get an opportunity to go to an area that is infested with spotted lanternfly. It's not as easy to hone your eye to this pest as you might think for a pest that's so big and so showy. They're a little tricky to find. Um, you know, begin watching for Tree of Heaven, but that is really not the only thing you should be looking at as well. Um, and again, we uh, um, we did, I'll get to, get to the pre-printed door hangers, which are here. We had these in advance and we had them for when we got a report, we could go and stick, um, and stick them on the doors and just kind of say, hey, we found something, um, you know, we're, we're looking for it, let us know if you find it. But we ended up using these as well with a, added a sticker to it that was like, we're, we're, we came to your property and we need to treat. Uh, so having these door hangers ready to go, um, a way to contact homeowners because they're not typically home during the day when you're there and begin your first level of communication was incredibly helpful. Again, I'll be glad to talk about um, kind of our treatment plans, but that's not really the point for today. And I know I'm rounding the corner to, uh, to being out of time. Uh, so, and we have a lot more to talk about. And I was told to include um, the, uh, the only two employees I have that I'm allowed to call cute and rub their ears without getting reported to HR. We have two um, canines that um, we obtained through USDA and they are funded through uh, USDA. Goose and Keita are sister, uh, brother and sister. 
We've had them for about two years. They're trained to, um, to find egg masses, but we have found that they can find all life stages. The dogs are as much of an outreach tool as they are a, um, uh, uh, a tool to find spotted lanternfly. They've been wonderful um, for both. They are not foolproof. So, you know, the idea that they could come through an area and we could certify it free of spotted lanternfly is that is not necessarily true, but they do find things that we just can't find, you know, areas that are impossible for us to see. Um, they can pick up a scent from quite a distance away. Um, and, and be able to find, and I'll be glad to talk to anybody who's interested in learning more about the canine programs. This is when they first became certified and came to our state. Uh, we had a shipment of native plants that came to us from New Jersey that when they opened the shipment, it was infested with spotted lanternfly. They were, you know, insects came out of the shipment. So as soon as our, our dogs came to North Carolina, as soon as they were trained and came to North Carolina, they followed up with an inspection. Amy had hung a CAPS um, a survey trap there in that area as well, but uh, we utilize them in a lot of situations. And um, they, I normally have a very professional slide as my last slide for questions, but um, I was hoping that uh, I could relay that um, in my very short period of time with you, I've gotten you as excited to go and find and look for spotted lanternfly as goose is in this picture. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Joy. That's a great picture. <laughs> uh, please put questions in the Q and A as you think of them. I guess my question is, what is that one thing that you wish you had known ahead of time that you could share with others? Oh, um, I don't know, Paul and Amy. I might defer to you. I'm trying to think of uh, maybe if each of us chime in, because I have a feeling it'll all be kind of different. If you guys can oh. think. Think right off the top of your head. The one thing I wish somebody had told us, um, you know, I will say, I, I think that um, I think that the importance of tree of heaven, you've got to have a starting point, but we've all been leaning on the information that came out early on for spotted lanternfly. And we have been relying solely on treating tree of heaven and inspecting tree of heaven. And we have found it in North Carolina, at least that, um, that, uh, that you know they like lots of things, and if that's the only way you're basing your inspection, you're likely going to miss them, particularly as uh, as the insects move um, through their life stages. Paul and Amy, what do you think? What's the one thing you wish somebody had told you guys? Uh, I'll be glad to go. Um, hi everyone, this is Paul Adams with the entomologist with NCDA. Um, I think for me, um, trying to put a, a value. Um, and, and sort of fathom the amount of labor that it takes to, to do something like this to mount a very rapid response with eradication in mind. It, if, you're, if you have field staff, like regional field staff that already have a workload and you're relying on them to do additional work that's sort of outside of their scope, it becomes very difficult and very wearing. And so I think having a plan for how to either acquire other labor or contract other labor um, is, is crucial in in just keeping kind of everybody. I don't want to say happy necessarily, but you know, just kind of in in good fighting shape and good spirits. I think so. Yeah, and I guess I'll just uh, expand on that. This is uh, Amy Michael, Caps Coordinator for uh, North Carolina. So. Um, yeah, I would say it just all goes back to the funding. Like I would say if you're looking for uh, what to do, hit the ground running, uh, try to have a budget in place ahead of time. And if you're not able to acquire, you know, labor or uh, materials ahead of time, just have everything in mind uh, and be ready to mobilize that very quickly because, you know, it, this is a pest that does not care really about the any of the delays or constraints that you may have for acquiring any of those products and it, it can get out of hand very quickly unfortunately thank you there's a question about the canines how difficult is it to train detection canines for spotted lanternfly is this scalable so we had, um, we received our canines trained from USDA. It was as much training our handlers as it was our canines when they, they spent a month in Noonan, Georgia, and then a month in Virginia. 
um, training and they have recertification every year. So it hasn't been our state that has trained them, but if you want to check with some other states, there are um, a couple other states that have done their own training of canines. I think Tennessee's working on that now. And um, I want to say maybe Maryland, um, but there are a couple other states that have done their own training, but I can't really speak to that because we haven't trained the dogs, but I'll be glad to connect anybody with our handlers to answer any of those questions. Thank you. Uh, is North Carolina thinking about setting up internal quarantine? And can you clarify what you said in your presentation that North Carolina is not setting up a permit system? So we have chosen not to set up an internal quarantine simply because we, you know, we feel like they've, you know, um, you know, quite honestly, the insect moves in such a way that what are you quarantining? Um, it can move on anything, anywhere. And so we did not want to, the only thing we really have regular, well, we have regulatory authority over anything that can move the pest. The only thing we realistically can get to are agricultural commodities, areas that we're already inspecting. So it felt very unfair to tie the hands of agricultural commodities when that's not the most likely pathway to move the pest. We're not going to stop campers. We're not going to be able to check every truck. We're not going to be able to um, ensure that it, that absolutely nothing is moving uh, this pest. And so, you know, instead we're really focusing efforts on um, on on so much survey and making sure that we're highlighting where the pest actually is as opposed to setting up the quarantine. And if you look at the map, it's misleading. The um, the area in North Carolina that has spotted lanternfly is only about five, five miles, a five mile radius. And it is right on the border of Forsyth and Guilford County. So it looks like it's two counties, but it really is a very small concentrated area. Uh, and then the permitting system. Um, no, we had, did not plan on setting up a permitting system. And instead, we are working towards outreach. We created a fantastic document. We, Sarah Locke, our Spongy Moth Program Manager, I'm not even going to attempt to take credit for that, created this fantastic um, foldable outreach that we are distributing to all companies within the um, the quarantine area, or well, it's not quarantine, within the area where Spotted Lanternfly is established. And then we're also, um, uh, we have our temp staff. Um, Amy can speak to that more. There, um, our, we have a temp staff that that is their, their sole goal is to be in that area, not only surveying, but also um, working with companies and providing outreach. And really in the end, that's what the permitting system is, is it's just a form of outreach to make sure that they're aware of what the pest is and how to move it and ways to be able to check um, vehicles before they leave to ensure you're not moving the pest. So we really feel like we're accomplishing the same thing without a formal permitting system. But we are prepared should, should another state require permitting. Amy, Paul, do you feel like I, was there anything I left off of that? I mean, I think we could probably spend another two or three hours talking about it, but I think you you, <laughs> you, you gave them Agreed. the- <laughs> We feel like this is all we talk about. Like somebody said earlier, you know, there's, uh, it feels like the sky's always falling and there's always the, the new pest du jour and uh, we seem like it, we just can't keep up. But I do feel like spotted lanternflies, all we've talked about for the last couple of years uh, when there are a lot of other, other really, um, more significant regulatory pests. Thank goodness this was these weren't years that um, that it all hit us at once. Um, do you have any advice uh, regarding land access? Every state is different. So, you know, I know for Virginia, they had to have signed waivers and it was, um, you know, they had to communicate with each person and they were finding it really difficult to even to even be able to go on their property and survey. They had to get uh, permission and they, you know, that became the challenge for them Monday through Friday to try to find someone at home to speak with. And then COVID hit and nobody wants to answer their door and people are much more than, you know, because of our political climate, they like the government way less than they ever once did. And so we're facing hurdles in that way. So for North Carolina, we are fortunate um, that we have um, some of some less restrictive um, regulations that do allow us to go on a property. So I, it's, that's a really difficult to answer because it's different for everyone. Um, I will say that's also a good thing about the canine. People don't like regulators and they don't like the government, but they love dogs. So oftentimes they can be our, um, our key to, to gain access. But 
I wish I had a, a really great blanket answer, but um, but you know it really just depends on on what your state allows and knowing that in advance and figuring out how to work around that. We did adjust things a little bit to where we, because um, initially we were focusing on every single property, private um, or commercial, and the, um, and we do have acknowledgments and ability to, to go back to those properties and treat. However, we um, uh, are focusing our treatments this year on commercial properties as opposed to having to to um, spend as much time on private land where you're worried about dogs and access to somebody's backyard and people not being thrilled about you just showing up in their yard or having to get permission. So really focusing on commercial properties now has been, has, has kind of been the key to, to move a little faster. And I might expand on that a little bit too. So um, those acknowledgement forms um, are actually embedded into the map. So that way it um, kind of shows our field staff when they're going back to uh, resurvey or treat, you know, what kind of the attitude of the landowner there is, if there's any, you know, special calls that need to be made for security purposes, or if there's any hazards present. Um, and then, uh, let's see, beyond that, uh, yeah, we're, again, really focusing on those commercial properties this year, because they have the higher risk of, you know, continual out of state or out of county spread. And our contact information was on the bottom of that. Um, I don't want to run our time over, but our contact information is in there. So for all of our, it's, it's our name dot, first name dot, last name at ncagr.gov. And of course, it's on our website as well. But, you know, we are where we are because states were so transparent and wonderful to share information with us. And we're happy to share the information we have as well. Should anybody have any questions or like more information from us? Great. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today, especially in the late afternoon over there. So thank you so much again. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. So we will head to break. Uh, we will reconvene with the regional portion and the Washington portion um, at 2.15 Pacific time. So grab some tea or some coffee, run to the bathroom, and then please be back at 2.15. We will start promptly at 2.15. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, if you're just joining us online via the TVW live stream, welcome to the Washington State Spotted Lanternfly Action Plan webinar. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, we are now going to hear from Washington State speakers as well as some other regional partners. And for this section, there's going to be a Q&A panel and discussion at the end of all the talks. So that's gonna begin at about 3.30 this afternoon, Pacific time. So all questions are gonna be addressed then, uh, but you're still welcome to put them into the Q&A box on your Zoom toolbar whenever you think of them. And we will address them all at once there at the end. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Jessica LaBelle to speak about Washington State Action Plan. Uh, Jessica is the Invasive Species Program Specialist with the Washington Invasive Species Council. And I just wanted to note before I stop sharing that uh, she created the wonderful template that, well, that you see right there on the screen <laughs> that I've been using. So she's done a great job with that. I think it's, it's really wonderful. So I'll turn it over to you, Jessica. Thanks, Maria. I jumped the gun a little bit and stole the, <laughs> stole the screen sharing from me because I got excited. Um, so welcome, everyone. I'm Jessica LaBelle. I'm the Invasive Species Program Specialist for the Washington Invasive Species Council. And if you're just joining us live streaming on TVW today, um, we've had some great speakers sharing a nationwide perspective on spotted lanternfly, as well as some best practices from North Carolina. Shout out to North Carolina five days from detection to response is an amazing goal to have and serious props. So today I'm gonna to be talking about Washington State, um, our concerns regarding spotted lanternfly, what's at risk and how we're preparing. 
So this is the current spread of spotted lanternfly in the US. Um, the initial detection was in Pennsylvania in 2014, and it's now in 14 different states with um, infestations and several other states that are concerned. Um, all this spread came from one introduction of spotted lanternfly, believed to be on a shipment of stone coming from Asia. So you can see 2014 was not that long ago, and it's moved pretty quickly, even though not every county in um, infested states has spotted lanternfly. The fact that it's moved so fast in a short period of time is very concerning. So one of the things that was done in preparation for spotted lanternfly um, spreading is a study regarding habitat suitability for the spotted lanternfly in the um, continuous United States. And this image is from that study and shows in the red, the most suitable habitat uh, for spotted lanternfly. The yellow is medium suitability, green is low suitability, and then the white or unshaded areas are areas that are unsuitable um, for spotted lanternfly. So you might want to note that this covers a large portion of our agricultural lands in the US, as well as several of our major cities. So that's pretty concerning. The part of the study also focused on Washington State specifically. Um, same. Uh, color scheme here with red is areas of high suitability, yellow medium, and green low, with white with unsuitable areas. And you'll notice that that really focuses on the I-5 corridor, which is in Western Washington, which is very heavily populated compared to the rest of the state. And then most concerningly, Eastern Washington has a lot of colors on that side. And that is really where our agricultural breadbasket is in Washington, as well as significant tribal land. So what's at risk here in Washington and why are we so concerned? So Washington farmers produce over 300 different commodities. Um, not all of them are plants and not all of those plants are ones that spotted lanternfly are interested in, but a lot of them uh, do coincide. And this is a great infographic from the Washington State Department of Agriculture and showing all the important contributions that Washington makes um, to our agricultural economy and to our food supply. And what's great about this infographic is that the larger the, the words are on here, the greater the uh, production. So spotted lanternfly uh, preys on a over 170 known species of plants and trees. And that number is growing as they continue to sweep westward and are exposed to new species. Uh, so that's of great concern. Um, major crops of concern are gonna be some that are found on this infographic here. So grapes, um, hops, cherries, peaches, other stone fruits. Um, apples, almonds, pine and other conifers, hardwoods, and then culturally significant ethnobotanicals. And that's gonna be plants that are important to our tribal nations and indigenous communities, not just traditional foods, but also traditional medicines, traditional shelter making materials, ceremonial uh, materials, things that you can't really put a price on could be at risk as well. So here's a little expansion um, on that where we did put some prices on things. And these numbers are all from 2021. And these are annual um, economic impacts of Washington agricultural commodities. So apples in 2021, that was $2.185 billion. Um, we're one of the, we're very proud of our apples in Washington. If you haven't had a Washington apple, I strongly recommend it. Oh. <laughs> um, hops at 482.2 million per year. Cherries, 476.4 million dollars per year. Grapes, 300.7 million. Blueberries, 228.3 million. And then timber, 3.06 billion dollars per year. Um, Washington accounts for 25 percent 
of US log and lumber product exports and 9% of US paper products. So pretty important forests as well in our working forests. Um, cultural resources, which I just talked about, are culturally significant ethnobotanicals. You can't really put a price on those. Um, our environment, Washington is you know, known as the evergreen state for a reason, and um, we want it to remain beautiful and for everyone to enjoy. Can't really put a price on that. And then something a lot of people don't think about, but our communities as well. Um, trees and plants are important to our urban and suburban landscapes. And uh, in infested areas in other states where spotted lanternfly um, has really taken over, there's been a real damage uh, done to street trees, you know, which provide shade, promote our mental well being. Um, if you own property and you have trees, you know, I know you're pretty attached to your trees. So that goes for, for everybody. So a lot of things here that are potentially at risk. So how will it get here? Um, the good news is that spotted lanternfly is not here yet. Um, and the other good news is it can only really jump, crawl, or fly for short distances. They're not very good flyers, um, not like the house fly that will get inside and personally challenge you for the rest of the day to, to catch it. Uh, you can actually just walk right up and grab a spotted lanternfly. They're, they're not very good at getting away from you. And um, what really moves an invasive species then? Like, how do they get around? Well, what moves an invasive species is really anything that moves. Invasive species are primarily moved inadvertently by people, whether that's on moving vans or outdoor uh, recreational equipment or furniture that people are moving from an infested area to a non-infested area, um, hitching a ride on your car, um, in the undercarriage, in wheel wheels, on rail cars, on shipping containers. Um, really, again, anything that moves. We've all been sitting at a stoplight and kind of noticed a bug on our windshield that's just hanging on for dear life. And we're like, I guess you're going to the east side today, buddy. Like, <laughs> um, I often think about how confused that little bug must be when it gets there. But these are the ways that these guys move around. They're very stealthy hitchhikers and all life stages can hitchhike to new areas. And this slide shows some of those life stages, the little graphic in the middle with a spotted lanternfly on a tree trunk that's covering its egg mass. So the egg masses can be laid on um, smooth and they really seem to like rusty surfaces in particular, but they like both natural and man-made surfaces. So again, they're laying eggs on things that can be moving all over the place. Um, the adults, of course, are the most notable with the beautiful, brilliant red, um, black and white hind wing. But it should be noticed that, should be noted that those um, beautiful red wings are not always gonna be visible. It's really gonna be if they're startled or if they're about to take flight that you're gonna see those. Most of the time they're gonna look like the uh, graphic on the far left where their wings are closed and kind of held um, bottom to bottom and vertical. And uh, then on the far right, we have the juvenile stages, the young nymphs, um, which are gonna be the first through third in stars, I believe are the uh, small black insects with the white spots. And then the final instar before they become an adult with the beautiful wings is the red with the white and the black spots. So all of these can be hitchhiking um, and we want everyone to know what these look like and to be keeping an eye out for them so that they don't travel to places where we don't want them to be. And uh, you may be thinking, well, um, in Washington state, you know, we're on the other side of the country from current infestations that I showed in the, the nationwide graphic, but we are finding dead ones on the west coast. Um, dead specimens have already been found in California and in Oregon. Um, so they can get here. So kind of compounding the issue is that these egg masses or adult spotted lanternfly might be hidden and difficult to see. Um, and early detection is critical. 
So you can see some photos here of people looking under the undercarriage of vehicles for egg masses. The uh, photo on the far right has an egg mass that looks just kind of like a smear of mud. They're blend in very easily with tree bark and with uh, concrete and other man-made surfaces. And then we're recommending um, in Washington, of course, that if you see something that you think might be spotted lanternfly to report it. Um, in infested states, will and later if they appear in Washington, they'll be moving to the egg scraping, which is what you see um, with the photo of the hand, someone scraping an egg mass into a container. And then the question of, well, how soon will it get here? And uh, the answer is we really don't know, but it could be any day. Uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture found out that spotted lantern fly was using the rail system to travel to uninfested areas. And this shows a uh, map of the major rail lines in North America. And you can see kind of the different colors as well as um, these very faint numbers. And those are the days of transit from one side to the other. So you can see a spotted lanternfly starts in infested areas on the East Coast, could very quickly um, arrive in Washington and they can survive. Both adults, nymphs and egg masses can survive that transit journey. So being prepared is extremely critical. One of the ways that Washington State is preparing um, for spotted lantern fly is to have reporting systems in place. So, um, you know, our North Carolina partners mentioned in their previous presentation about see it, see it, snap it, report it, and they stole that from other state. Well, we might have done that as well. It's great messaging. So, if you think you see a spotted lantern fly in Washington, please take a photo of it and report it, along with the location where you found it. Um, ideally as well, save the specimen if you can. Uh, spotted lanternfly don't bite or sting. They can't hurt you um, and you can handle them safely. And you can report three ways. You can email the Washington State Department of Agriculture's pest program at pestprogram at agr.wa.gov. You can report via the Washington Invasive Species Council's Washington Invasives app on your phone or tablet. And this is a great free app that has been instrumental in first detections of pests in Washington state before. So I highly encourage you to use that. You can find it in the Apple or Google Play Store. Um, you can also call uh, to try to reach a staff member at the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Pest Program Hotline, which is 800-443-6684. I've worked on many invasive species projects um, throughout my career, and I really cannot understate the role of the public in getting ahead of invasive species. Um, an incredible amount of progress has been made due to public reports. And these teams that we work in, when we have a lot of specialists, you know, we don't have great numbers of people working on these projects and we can't be everywhere all at once. I, I would love to be able to, to deploy an entomologist via helicopter um, to all over the state if needed, but we don't have the ability to do that. And so we really need eyes out there. We need eyes all across the state. So the role of the public, the role of industry and stakeholders and telling your, your folks and your field workers and anyone who might be outside or dealing with any of these commodities to keep an eye out and how to report to us is very critical. So something else I'd like to touch on and that we'll learn a little more about in um, one of our next presentations and is Tree of Heaven, so Alanthus altissima. Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly have a unique relationship. Um, Tree of Heaven is itself an invasive species. In Washington state, it's considered a class C weed, meaning it's either widespread or of agricultural concern. Um, in this case, it's both. <laughs> uh, Tree of Heaven is very fast spreading and growing. It forms thickets, it's difficult to control. It creates compounds that are toxic to other plants. And it has many routes of reproduction via seed, root suckers, stump sprouts, and it really likes to grow in disturbed areas. Um, 
So it does have a tendency to grow along rail lines. And if you see this uh, inset map of North America showing states that have tree of heaven, there are little pockets where um, tree of heaven can make a connection between the sides. So it could potentially move by a natural spread over time as well. And um, although spotted lanternfly can feed on over 170 species of trees and plants, it does have a preference for tree of heaven. And there's some research being done um, trying to understand this relationship that it has. When exposed to the tree of heaven at some point in its life cycle, spotted lanternfly um, will become a little more reproductively hardy. They can still reproduce and um, establish without it. Um, however, the presence of tree of heaven does seem to be uh, a, a potential concern for aiding the establishment of spotted lanternfly. And so since we're talking about tree of heaven, I wanted to list some resources here for assistance with tree of heaven. Um, first would be your, your local county noxious weed control board, your local conservation district, the Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board, or your local Washington State University Extension Office. Um, specific offices and services will vary depending on where you're located in Washington, but um, those are great places to start for resources if you are um, hoping to remove Tree of Heaven from your property. So some of the other preparations that Washington is doing is we're um, formulating a state action plan before the spotted lanternfly arrives here. Uh, preparation is key in invasive species uh, prevention and eradication. And so some of the ways that we're looking at preventing um, spotted lanternfly or responding to it is early detection and rapid response. Conducting education and outreach, that's via webinars, via in-person workshops across the state, um, presenting to industry and stakeholders and people who are going to be outside, people who are going to be in the field, the general public. Like I said, we need eyes everywhere. Um, so outreach is a very important tool, and we've learned that as best practices from other states as well. Um, the Washington State Department of Agriculture is also conducting a yearly visual survey and monitoring for spotted lanternfly in areas of concern. And then they're also moving forward with Tree of Heaven mapping and removal across the state. And the goal of the Spotted Lanternfly State Action Plan is really broad to focused planning. Um, it's kind of challenging to plan uh, all the environmental documents and um, plan of attack for a pest that hasn't made it to Washington yet. And so you don't know where it's going to pop up. And each area is gonna have a lot of site specific variables that are gonna be needed to really get the ball rolling. We need to know those things. So first taking a broad statewide view and being prepared for it to pop up really anywhere. And then once the detection is made, there'll be significantly focused planning on that area, delimiting, et cetera. Um, quarantines and rulemaking is something that the plan addresses as well, um, again, because that would be pretty site specific. It's more towards outlining the steps of the process, so it's more streamlined when the time comes and setting up everything that can be done ahead of time um, to make this the most successful. And the Washington State Action Plan for Spotted Lanternfly is unique in that it's also examining potential impacts to culturally significant ethnobotanicals, not just our, import, our economically important agricultural commodities, which are extremely important, as you saw from some previous slides, but our plants that are important to tribal nations and indigenous communities. Um, you can't really put a price tag on plants used for ceremonies, traditional foods, medicines, but they are important. And part of the reason why we're focusing on this is because spotted lanternfly could pop up anywhere. And when it does, we wanna be able to notify everyone who would be affected and bring the right voices to the table. And that includes um, indigenous and tribal nations. 
We're also uh, doing research and learning best practices for dealing um, with detections and infestations of spotted lanternfly from other states. Again, shout out North Carolina. And um, as well as also preparing for potential long-term long management um, in case when this insect is detected, eradication is not possible, um, learning how to mitigate its effects and preparing for spotted lanternfly. So the Washington Invasive Species Council received a $90,000 grant from the U.S. Department of Agricultural, Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine. Uh, the name is a mouthful. It's usually referred to as USDA APHIS PPQ. And that was to prepare for spotted lanternfly. And one of the first things that we did is develop the spotted lanternfly preparedness advisory group. Um, I am the facilitator for that group and very proud to be so. It is a interagency and interorganizational knowledge base um, and communications pathway. And we have our partners listed on the side there. And this group is really instrumental in the development of the state action plan. It's being collaboratively written by not just responding agencies, but by informing being informed by industry and stakeholders. Uh, some of these funds will also be used by the Washington State Department of Agriculture to create uh, GIS tools, so mapping tools for outreach, um, for response support, show tree of heaven locations, we'll le learn about a little bit later, um, potential pathways that spot a lantern fly could arrive in Washington State, resource locations that are at risk, and also at-risk communities. Um, these funds are also being used to hold industry and stakeholder workshops, um, again, in person and virtually across the state. So we are, uh, we are being successful in getting the word out about Spotted Lanternfly. A lot more people in Washington know about it than they did prior to this project. And then most critically, um, the state action plan. So I am pleased to announce that the Washington State uh, Action Plan for Spotted Lanternfly is in its second draft, and it is available for comment and review. And we would really like to get comments and uh, content review from industry and other stakeholders and uh, persons that might be affected by spotted lanternfly. So if you want to take out your smartphone, um, you can use the camera on the QR code here to go directly to the state action plan. We also have a, a bit.ly, which is bit.ly slash slf underscore sap. That'll take you right to the state action plan. And also, if you registered through Zoom for this webinar, the page that you use to do that is the same page that has the state action plan uh, linked on it as well. So I'm gonna leave this up for a moment and continue speaking. Uh, so you have time to grab a screen cap of that QR code if necessary, or take a photo. Um, we are seeking comments opening today and our last content comments are due June 19th. So they'll be open for two weeks. Um, we are hoping to have a fully designed draft of number three, complete by July 3rd. And then the final draft will be uh, completed by July 31st. And we are asking that people, when they review the plan, provide feedback using a, a form that we've made to make it a little easier on you. So this QR code will take you to the feedback form. And it has the comment period there today through the 19th of June. Uh, again, you can use your smartphone camera on the QR code or take a screen cap of this for later. Um, we also made another uh, short URL for that, which is bit.ly slash 43F6RTM. And that'll take you right to the form. And we have the form split up into the different sections. So you can comment on the different sections of the plan as well as provide overall comment.
I'll leave that up for a moment. But um, we really wanted to make the state action plan as inclusive as possible and not just be responding agency driven. Ultimately, the responding agency, the Washington State Department of Agriculture, will be utilizing this state action plan in their response. But we really wanted to include everyone's voices that this would affect so we could have a more overall picture and be prepared as a state. All righty. So this slide has my contact information if you would like to uh, speak to me or have questions. It also has some information on the Washington Invasive Species Council, Washington Invasives app and a little graphic of what it would look like on your phone. And if you have questions for me, you know, please feel free to throw them into the Q&A. Uh, I do believe though that for this portion we are um, going to have those questions answered at a panel discussion at the end of the regional overview section. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. Yes, we are having questions for Jessica at the end, but please put them into the Q&A at any time. All right, we will move on to the next presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Greg Hobrick. If you are just joining us and missed the first part, uh, Greg is with the Washington State Department of Agriculture, and he is the Assistant Director of the Plant Protection Division, and he's going to be talking about Tree of Heaven mapping in Washington State. Yeah, thanks. I'm going to try to share my screen here, um, although the PowerPoint is not showing up. Let's see. Oh, there it is. All right. Can people see that? Uh, yeah, it just has to go into, um, we're seeing like the editing mode. This has to go okay. to pre presentation. Okay. I can't get out of this. Oh, there we go. So where's presentation mode at? Um, so up, up at the top, if you go to slideshow, For me? the little tab. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Like, which one is it? That one? Nope. Okay, you're close. Um, yeah. So now at the top, do you see under display settings? Display settings. Way at the top at the left. Ah, okay. Um, that click one? that, yeah. And then swap presenter view and slideshow. Okay. Yes, okay. Now we see the proper version. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry about yeah. that. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Greg Hobrick. I'm uh, acting assistant director for the plant protection division here at the Department of Agriculture. And I'm pinch hitting today for Wendy Descamp, who uh, couldn't be here. Um, so uh, unfortunately for you, you got to listen to me instead of Wendy, uh, but we will proceed anyway. Uh, so just kind of shout out to the pest program here uh, within the plant protection division and Jessica LaBelle, the previous speaker is a, one of our distinguished alumni, right? Um, she used to work for the pest program till Justin stole her away. Um, but the pest program's mission uh, is to you know, protect the state's agriculture environment, natural resources uh, by preventing high risk uh, plant diseases, weeds, snake, terrestrial snails and insects. So that's kind of the group that will uh, respond when spotted lanternfly does show up uh, here. And I wanna kind of give a shout out to the staff that's been working with the advisory group. Um, Sven Spieschiger is the pest program manager and we're fortunate to have him because he came to us from Pennsylvania, where uh, they have a lot of uh, spotted lanternfly issues. So he brings a lot of experience in dealing with that particular pest to Washington. Uh, Tiffany Paz, who's our uh, managing entomologist, and Josh Milnes, who is uh, kind of running point for us uh, for spotted lanternfly. Um, Wendy Descamp, again, of course, who's our, our noxious weed coordinator and, and kind of taking the lead on the tree of heaven issue. 
uh, Ryan Mojon, who's our pest program eradication coordinator and does most of the SEPA and all of that kind of documentation. Uh, Cassie Seahorse, who uh, is the pest program outreach specialist and does all that great educational stuff and provides training and does all that work. And then Landon Udo and Brant Carmen, who are in our location intelligence section uh, and develop the maps and collect the data, do all those kinds of things. And then lastly, Aaron Coyle, who is the uh, WSDA's emergency management program manager. So she's also been involved. Um, I'm not gonna go into biology or uh, identification of tree of heaven. Uh, it's, uh, we, there's a great brochure that's been put out by um, the uh, Department of Ag, as well as the Basis Species Council, Washington State University, uh, State Weed Board, and then Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And if you go, this is available in a lot of places, you can get it off our website or you can go elsewhere, but this describes kind of what you would look for, uh, for not only spotted lanternfly, but also for tree of heaven. So I'd encourage you to pick one of those up or print one off or, because uh, there's a lot of good info there. And I think it's being revised. Um, so it's being updated a little bit, but I'm not sure that's out yet. And I believe it's also being, uh, it's not already available in Spanish. It's being, uh, it will be made available in Spanish. So um, Jessica mentioned a lot of resources. We also at the Department of Ag have a web page and website. Um, if you go into, I'm not sure this is working, but if you, if you go into this little section, let's find it and type in tree of heaven or spot of lantern fly or whatever, it will take you uh, to where you wanna go. It's, it's kind of a, it's not a, it's, it's not a real intuitive web <laughs> page, but it, uh, website, but it does work. Um, and there's lots of information here. Um, you can look at uh, the, um, well, we'll go down and look at the next stuff. Uh, the next site here, uh, there we go. Um, this is a little bit further down that page and you can see there's some uh, links to some other to resources and mapping and tree of heaven. And right at the very top in that little box right there, there's the uh, report tree of heaven, uh, where you can click on that and report tree of heaven to, um, it'll go through the, I think it's through the WISC, uh, the WISC uh, account or whatever, and we'll wind up with us. But um, so you, again, you can look for that on WSDA website. Um, also, there's a really great video there. If you have time to watch it, it's only a little over eight minutes that was put together by Washington State University and then staff from from the pest program, uh, Wendy does camp and Cassie Seahorse. Uh, and it's really, really good if you're trying to figure out how to identify uh, Tree of Heaven and want to learn more about it. So I'd encourage you to go there and check that out. Um, Jessica touched on this a little bit, but Tree of Heaven uh, in Washington state is listed as a class C noxious weed by the Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board. Uh, that means typically that it's widespread in Washington, um, but so it's, there's too much of it to list as a class A or a class B, but it's still important to either a certain segment of agriculture or to a certain county or weed district. Um, so the other part of this is it's also listed on WSDA's prohibited plants and seed list. So it is prohibited to transport it, buy it, sell it, offer it for sale. Uh, or distributed anywhere within Washington state. So besides being uh, on the state weed list, it is on the quarantine list. So why are we worried about tree of heaven? Well, Jessica and previous speakers have, have described it pretty well that, you know, besides being a really nasty invasive species in its own right, it also has a, a complex relationship with the spotted lanternfly. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go into spotted lanternfly biology or in here. Um, there are lots of sources out there and resources out there for that. Um, but this one could definitely be a significant, have a significant impact to the crops in Washington. And Jessica again went over those, but grapes and hops, apples, cherries, peaches, plums, and hardwoods, um, oak pine or oak and maple. And so this could be a real, will be a real concern when it does arrive. 
And as again, Jessica mentioned this, there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of research and survey done that shows that there is a, a, a relationship between the two, not only in, in the United States, but uh, where it's been introduced in South Korea and Japan as well. So that's the reason, one of the reasons we're, we're looking for uh, Tree of Heaven uh, a little bit more robustly than we did in, in the several years ago. And this is what Tree of Heaven uh, distribution in Washington State looked like in 2018. This is all the data we had. Um, and so when we started thinking about in terms of spotted lanternfly coming to Washington and, and its, uh, it, its relationship with Tree of Heaven, we decided we needed to get a much better picture of what Tree of Heaven looked like here in, in Washington State. Um, so of course that takes money. And um, in 2020, we started doing some inventory uh, just using internal state general funds and then some funding that we receive every year from the Forest Service for general noxious weed work. Um, so we were able to get a little bit of survey done in 2020. And then in 2021, uh, we received a grant, US Forest Service, uh, State and Private Forestry grant for $70,000 to begin to um, do an inventory of Tree of Heaven and provide education and outreach to uh, potentially affected industries. In uh, 2020, Two, we submitted a supplemental budget request to the legislature uh, for $120,000 and that was funded. So uh, we've been using that since July 1, 2022. And then this past season, past year, we submitted a decision package uh, that was approved and was recently signed uh, by the governor for $240,000 for the upcoming biennium. Uh, so that's $120,000 a year for each of the fiscal years in, in the upcoming biennium. I really want to kind of shout, give a shout out to our governor's office and, and the legislature for being um, proactive and providing these funds, even though it's for a pest that really isn't here yet, other than, you know, doing some control with Tria Heaven. But I think uh, they understand the seriousness of this one. And, and we're, again, really good about providing some funds uh, to us to um, work on this and uh, proactively. Um, We've also been submitting another, several other grant proposals, and so far we haven't been successful, but uh, we will keep trying, and Josh Milnes is the one who's been putting a lot of those in, and uh, hang in there, Josh, we'll get, we'll get one of those eventually. Uh, Greg, about five minutes left. Okay. Um, so what do we do with those funds? A lot of those funds go out in interagency agreements, the county and oxus weed boards, uh, Underwood Conservation District. Uh, Sometimes we use a little bit of it for uh, staff salaries, but that's, that's really minimal. Um, we pay a little bit of Josh's time with that, but he does a lot of other projects for us as well. And Wendy's time is all covered. It's not paid out of this at all. We've got other funds for that. And then we use some of the funds for education and outreach. Uh, the agreements to the counties are for survey and then also trying out some different kinds of uh, control methods uh, see how they're going to work for us. So by providing those funds, this is what a current map looks like uh, for Tree of Heaven distribution. And it's this one isn't even up to date. I just, over the week weekend, I saw eight more Tree of Heaven reports just go through my, across my desk. So um, this, this is kind of a nice little viewer. I, I wanted to show you this viewer. If you go to WSDA's website and go into the Noxious Weed section, you can find this viewer. And that little box up here, um, in the upper right, that's a drop down menu and you can put any of our noxious weed species in there and it'll pull up uh, what our distribution, current distribution looks like. Um, and you can zoom in a little bit and you can tap one of those dots and it'll give you some information about that particular site. If you zoom in too far, the, the uh, dots will go away because we're trying to protect uh, private landowner um, confidentiality. Uh, not not provide too much information on where those are, but if you're, um, we do have all the metadata behind that if if, if you're interested. Um, and this is if you do go again, you go into the WSD website. You can 
click on this link uh, right down here and it, it will take you to that viewer and, and you can, there's some other things you can do within that, uh, that viewer. Okay, I used the, the same, uh, one of the same graphics that Jessica had here and, and uh, it's because, you know, wh why are we looking for Tree of Heaven? Um, and again, it's, Jessica explained quite a bit of that. Um, the natural spread at spotted lanterfly without any human vectors is estimated at an average of 12 miles per year in good weather. So obviously it's not gonna get here on its own for a long time. However, um, there's a really good chance that it'll arrive on a train car, uh, semi truck trailer. It could wind up coming via campers, uh, people that are transiting the state. So the idea here is to determine where we've got spotted lanternfly and then correlate that with the areas of high risk, like uh, ports, parks and recreation areas, uh, places where rail cars uh, gather and trucks and those kinds of things, because we obviously don't have enough resources to uh, try to control or to try to uh, affect any all of the tree of heaven in the state. So again, it's a way to target and be more specific uh, with, with the higher risk areas. Um, Got two minutes left. Okay, and part of that is um, tree heaven reporting. Uh, Jessica touched on this, but if you're an agency or you're a large group and you can provide t, you know, tree of heaven location to us, we, we'd like those via shape files or geo databases or spreadsheets. Um, the public can, can report uh, Tree of Heaven via the WISC app or the EdMaps app or iNaturalist, and we all share the data, so it will eventually wind up coming to us at WSDA. And as far as moving forward, um, this is kind of what we have planned. Uh, continue efforts to document the distribution of Tree of Heaven, prioritize areas of high risk uh, for spotted lanternfly introduction, uh, try to seek additional funding and resources to implement Tree of Heaven control in those high risk areas, Continue education and outreach for Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly. Identify resources to quickly and effectively respond to any introduction of Spotted Lanternfly, and that's going to be important. And then as this group is met to develop, continue to develop the Washington State Action Plan for Spotted Lanternfly. So there's contact information for uh, Wendy. Uh, if, if you have Tree of Heaven questions, or you can contact Wendy if you have a uh, Spotted Lanternfly concerns or questions, contact Josh Milnes. Uh, don't contact me because I don't know much of anything. So I would encourage you to um, get a hold of those two folks if you have any questions. And with that, that's all I have. I'll give this back if I can. Thank you so much, Greg. Stop share. Okay. All right. Next up, we have Dr. Kyle Berkey with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And Kyle's gonna talk to us about California's preparation and their state action plan. Hey, how's it going? Uh, so do you want me to share or do you have the presentation? Yeah, I can share if you want to, it is totally up to you. Yeah, if it's okay, you can, uh, you can pull it up. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Just let me know when I can start. All right, anytime. Okay. So uh, yes, my name is Kyle Berkey. I'm the primary state entomologist for the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And I will be talking to you about how our state has been preparing for uh, the possible introduction of spotted lanternfly. Next. So uh, I'll start out with an introduction to spotted lanternfly, you know, pretty much a review for everybody, I'm sure at this point, go over the threat that we feel that it poses to California, talk about the science advisory panel that we convened and uh, which led into the development of our action plan. Next, please. So the spotted lanternfly was uh, first known to be introduced to the United States in 2014, Pennsylvania. Uh, since then, it has spread to 14 Eastern states. I, I think that's uh, up to date. 
it is polyphagous, but uh, grapes and Tree of Heaven are preferred hosts. And grapes are still the only crop um, that I know of that has been reported to be significantly impacted um, on a large scale by spotted lanternfly. And uh, besides the impacts to grapes, nuisance impacts are also reported to be significant. So things like agritourism or, you know, even some urban areas like just people enjoying the uh, sidewalks and stuff like that. And of course, backyards. And then on the right, you can see this is uh, the life cycle as it is known to be in the Eastern United States. Next slide, please. So in California, as you know, all of you know, we, we have a very large wine industry. It's worth $88 billion in total economic impact, makes up half of a million jobs and um, eight and a half billion dollars in taxes. As I'm, you know, Washington has also has a significant wine industry. Next slide. So um, you may have seen this map before. Various models have suggested that parts of California and other areas on the West Coast may be suitable for the establishment of spotted lanternfly. Um, we also have hosts, including grapevine and tree of heaven, both of which are common in the state. Um, and, and I'll just add, you know, as a caveat, there's multiple caveats with these models, um, one of which is the use of bioclimatic variables, which uh, not sure that that will necessarily give a uh, uh, necessarily give a, a really accurate picture of, of the limiting factors, you know, uh, in a place like California that has a completely different climate system, you know, Mediterranean climate, where you have dry summers and wet winters. Um, there's multiple pathways for the possible established introduction and establishment of spotted lanternfly. We think that at this point, where uh, spotted lanternfly is, is still fairly far to the east of us, that the egg stage is probably the most likely uh, stage you know, that uh, the most likely stage for the introduction of spotted lanternfly, uh, just because we know that the survivability of nymphs and adults is, is fairly limited. You know, it's a few days without food. Um, so we don't think that that is nearly as risky as the uh, durable egg masses that overwinter and, and can move, you know, over several months time on almost any kind of object. Next slide. So what have we done in California to prepare for the potential introduction of spotted lanternfly in our state? We've enacted a state exterior quarantine. We are conducting on an annual basis, a, a high risk survey for spotted lanternfly across the state. We have conducted education for county personnel via the Pest Prevention University. That, that's uh, something that's held every year. And, uh, and the different counties participate in that. We have carried out outreach to industry. We have helped develop, supported, and helped develop training for master gardeners, California master gardeners. That's a UC program. And uh, the goal there is to basically have, um, you know, these people who are already out in the field, they're already knowledgeable all over the state. They're looking at plants with various pest disease problems to kind of let them be one of our, uh, you know, uh, the eyes in the field, basically, because we know that this is something where uh, there's a good chance the first person to see it is not going to be, you know, a government official. Um, also, we have supported research on biological control, economic impacts potential for establishment in California of spotted lanternfly, pathway risks, and other things. Next slide. And as I alluded to previously, we, we did convene a science advisory panel and this uh, led into the development of an action plan. Next slide. The, you know, each of these things are continuously updated uh, based on latest information. So just as an example, we recently added some agricultural items to our exempt list for our spotted lanternfly state exterior quarantine. So based on the uh, input from the 
science advisory panel, we decided that harvested fruits, leafy greens, and grains should not be regulated. Next slide. So the ad hoc spotted lanternfly science advisory panel, this was held in 2021. It was a three-day event. The goal was to develop was to get recommendations and information that would be uh, used to uh, develop a spotted lanternfly action plan. And actually this fulfills our responsibility under the food and ag code to consult with outside experts when we develop things like, like the action plan. The panel was composed of 11 people, uh, heavily represented by East Coast, uh, Penn State, USDA, also, we had University of California people and uh, UC Cooperative Extension to provide a California, uh, you know, some California perspective based on California agricultural conditions. So we had this panel of 11 people. We asked them 50 questions about spotted lanternfly biology, detection, eradication, and management. Next slide. And, and I'll just go over some of the key recommendations and conclusions of the panel. So, um, so the panel indicated that in the eastern United States, again, vineyards are basically the main, are where you're seeing the main economic impacts of spotted lanternfly in agriculture. Um, there's also, you know, also economic, but more indirect, you have regulatory impacts in nurseries and Christmas tree farms because you have to get those certified for shipment out of quarantine areas. The panel uh, supported that visual survey is still considered the most effective detection and delimitation method. There's a number of traps, as a lot of you I'm sure are aware of, uh, these traps are not the traps may be useful in certain situations, but they are not a replacement for visual survey. In terms of eradication, the panel recommended that eradication activities be conducted on a broad scale, you know, very aggressive, cover as much, uh, as much, as many properties within your area and treatment area as possible, uh, make sure that you have access, you know, <laughs> things like that. So they recommended that an area within one quarter mile of all detection sites be uh, treated in eradication. And uh, the limitation was the, the radius recommended was two miles from each detection. So these are fairly large areas. Dinotephrin, the systemic and uh, the contact by fenthrin, those were the recommended Treatments for eradication activities, dinotephrin for tree of heaven and bifenthrin for uh, essentially all living plants. And the panel pointed out that access challenges would be a, a critical weakness in, in any detection or eradication project. So things like, uh, you know, you have some properties that you, where you can't get a hold of the property owners, you can't get access, uh, things like that, you know, those are the things that can cause the delimitation, you know, the detection or eradication project to fail. Um, you really have to get access to pretty much everything, um, even a small pocket of trees, you know, that could harbor spotted lanternfly and your eradication could fail because of that. Next slide. Sure, you have about five minutes left. Okay. So, um, so the action plan. So we took all of the recommendations of the science advisory panel and other available science, and uh, and we developed this action plan, which is now posted on our website. And in the plan um, are included sample submission protocols, survey and delimitation protocols, quarantine actions, and um, also methods of eradication, including treatments and host control, i.e. Uh, tree of heaven control. Next slide, please. So what if spotted lantern fly is found in California? Let's just go through this and I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, point out that these are guidelines, they're options, and uh, what's in the action plan right now that we reserve the right to change that and modify it based on the situation. So this shouldn't be considered like, you know, this is exactly what we're going to do. 
is written in stone. It's not like that. Next slide, please. So at first there will be a delimitation from a find. Um, visual survey within two miles of each detection site, like I, I mentioned before. If we find any more spotted lanternflies, you further expand the delim area to you know two miles from that point as well. And we may also uh, look at expanding the delimitation area along transportation corridors, so highway or rail line, something like that. If that goes through the detection area, we may want to uh, expand the delimitation in those along those corridors just to account for any potential artificial spread. Next slide. Eradication options. Again, these are just options. Um, so for egg masses, we've considered scraping and using uh, Golan pest spray oil, the um, soybean oil to treat the eggs. Uh, you, we can use, uh, we have the option of using, or not currently have the option, but we are pursuing the option of using bifenthrin spray within 400 meters of a fine site. And that would be for all plants. And then for a tree of heaven in the same area, 400 meters, you would use dinotefrin, which is the systemic, and that would only be applied once per year. And there's also the possibility of removing tree of heaven, uh, whether it's uh, with herbicide or perhaps manually, but that's a, either way, it's a labor intensive process. So um, right now what we have is that we would consider an infestation of spotted lanternfly eradicated after the equivalent of three life cycles, basically three years since the last detection. And that would be uh, the calendar date, you know, to the day. Uh, there's something in there about if it's a leap year or not. But uh, but yeah, essentially three years from the last, um, last find of spotted lanternfly. Next slide, please. Just a couple minutes left. Okay, sorry. So, um, and there's a possibility of having a quarantine if we find two adult spotted lanternfly within one mile of each other, or uh, visibly mated female, one nymph, or an egg mass, and, and that area would be one mile. Next slide. Thanks. So, last slide. So, um, basically, you know. If, we have a quarantine situation. We're going to regulate, put all of the regulated entities under a compliance agreement, under compliance agreements, plural. Um, we will conduct inspections to make sure that they're complying with the restrictions, trace back, trace forward investigations, to try to find out where this may have come from, where, where else we may need to look within the state. And uh, of course, looking at certification protocols with USDA and industry, researchers, et cetera. Next slide. That's actually backwards. And that is it. And yeah, thank you for moving the slides. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Kyle. All right. Our next speaker in this session is Dr. Chandra Moffitt. And today, Chandra's going to be talking to us. Uh, she's with Agriculture Canada, and she's going to be talking to us about British Columbia and their approach uh, to the spotted lanternfly. And I realized I was still muted, so hopefully, I was going to fix that. And can you see my slides? Okay. Yes, it looks beautiful. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's been such an informative session. So excited to see the other presenters and hear about updates um, from different parts of the US. So keeping in mind how much time we had to talk um, about different uh, areas in the US, I'm gonna try and talk about, um, give an overview of what's happening in Canada and British Columbia. And I won't have time to go into very much detail on any particular thing. Um, but there's the Q&A and always happy for people to get in touch with me. Yeah, my slides will advance. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of context as to where I'm situated. So I work in British Columbia's Okanagan Valley. 
I'm about four hours uh, east of Vancouver in a beautiful little town called Summerland. Um, it's a gorgeous Mediterranean climate, a uh, semi-arid shrub set grassland desert ecosystem, and our core areas um, of agricultural production here are grapes. We have a wonderful grape and wine industry, as well as British Columbia's tree fruit industry, uh, primarily apples and cherries, as well as peaches. Um, unfortunately, we also have a very dense corridor of tree of heaven that perfectly intersects our tree fruit and wine grape wine grape growing region here. So I work in a few different core areas um, as a research scientist with Agriculture Canada. My role is very analogous to a USDA ARS entomologist. Um, I focus on the biology, ecology, and population genetics of invasive insects, development and long-term evaluation of biological control programs for both invasive insects and invasive weeds as well as in the last three or four years, I've branched out and I work as part of a very interdisciplinary team uh, to support our local Indigenous nations with revitalization, revitalization of culturally significant food plants. And my particular role is looking at risk impacts and mitigation of invasive insects that would impact culturally significant food plants. So for all of those reasons, I'm working on spotted lanternfly. Um, following the invasion in the U.S., a number of researchers in Canada, of course, uh, you know, became concerned and started um, interacting with their colleagues in the U.S. And efforts uh, have been underway in Canada for a few years to prepare for the eventual arrival of spotted lanternfly. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the formation of National and then within British Columbia, our Provincial Technical Advisory Group. I'll give a bit of an overview on the research being conducted in Canada on spotted lanternfly. And I will finish up with a bit more on Tree of Heaven. And I had the opportunity to cut a lot of slides uh, because of the wonderful information already shared um, and talk a little bit about my research group's involvement and development of biological control for Tree of Heaven, which is really how we came to work on spotted lanternfly um, over the last few years, looking at impacts of Tree of Heaven and conducting research on biocontrol for Tree of Heaven um, seeing all the literature that came out with the strong associations between spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. So, of course, as other um, panelists have mentioned today, the very broad host range of spotted lanternfly means it's at very high risk of economic damage in Canada to many different agricultural sectors, um, to horticulture, to, to forestry, um, and to our Indigenous nations. So, here in the Okanagan, as I mentioned, grapes and tree fruits, but in other parts of Canada, um, berries, hardwoods, um, all of the same crop species and hardwoods that are at risk in the US, we have most of those, the ones in the Northern US, we have most of those in Canada as well. And they're at very high risk of um, damage and impacts due to spotted lanternfly. I'm not sure if anyone had shown this or if I missed a slide that just showed um, a bit of an outline of the native range in Asia where spotted lanternfly has originated from and the current uh, introduced range, of course, here in North America. We've seen that zoomed in um, the latest map um, from the Stop SLF website from the New York State IPM program, looking at the distribution of spotted lanternfly as of last month. So we're always updating this, but Really in the Canadian context, um, in the last year or so, the detection of spotted lanternfly in counties of three different states that are very close to the Niagara region of Ontario, which is another core uh, wine grape and horticultural production area in Canada that is now at very high risk um, of intercepting um, spotted lanternfly. Unfortunately, you know, when we talk amongst ourselves, we think that a detection of spotted lanternfly in Ontario this year is quite likely and there's many efforts um, underway on the ground in Ontario uh, in terms of surveillance and detection. We know that spotted lanternfly has many vectors for hitchhiking and other presenters have touched more on that today as well as the fact that there have been interceptions um, of dead spotted lanternfly in western North America in the past so it is a matter of time uh, most likely before we have interceptions, detections, and hopefully not, but probable establishment on the west coast of North America. Spotted lanternfly um, is considered an insect that really has the potential to have a pan invasion and invade um, many temperate regions of the world across different continents and impact many plant species um, and have cascading impacts 
in all of those regions, as well as the impacts of control. So we've seen other presenters talk about um, products that are used and being registered for spotted lanternfly control, and the downstream impact of those insecticides um, is likely to be heavy as well. So here in Canada, a National Technical Advisory Committee on Spotted Lanternfly was formed uh, in early 2022. Uh, this is led by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency who regulates all uh, primary plant pests in Canada. And as spotted lanternfly is a primary plant pest not yet established, it is the mandate of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uh, to regulate and to um, coordinate. And of course, they're working closely with the USDA. Um, and I'm not from Canadian Food Inspection Agency, but I work very closely with them so I can share a little bit of the work that they're leading. So active surveillance program across Canada for spotted lanternfly via visual ground surveys, um, traps. So now bug barrier traps in the, in the prior years, uh, circle trunk traps. And really like um, we saw for the US, um, there's high risk areas that are being surveyed and the primary um, areas really being surveyed in these provinces with um, core agricultural production are transportation corridors and commodity corridors, um, areas where transport trucks will be coming into Canada for inspections, where um, buses with tourists, for instance, will be coming into Canada. So really focusing in on those, um, those likely corridors. Uh, CFIA is taking um, a number of different pieces of information to develop risk models for Canada. There's draft risk models available that are internal to CFIA that I've had the privilege of seeing a bit of those, and those data are being used to identify the primary areas uh, for surveillance. CFIA has uh, provided financial support uh, for both the Canadian Forest Service, we don't have that uh, articulated there, and Agriculture Canada to scientists in both of our agencies to conduct research, as CFIA doesn't conduct research on cold tolerance, trap deployment methods, and at-risk plant species, and I'll tell you more about that. And CFA additionally supports early detection through outreach and education. They have a number of different ways that they're doing that and working with many partners. Um, as, and um, the piece that I'll tell you a little bit more about is they lead the Spotted Lanternfly Technical Advisory Committee for Canada. So the membership of that led by CFA, it also includes nationally uh, scientists from Agriculture Canada. I'm one of the scientists that sits on the Technical Advisory Committee as well as from the Canadian Forest Service of Natural Resource Canada and members from Canadian Border Service Agencies. We have a number of provincial agricultural industries that are sitting as well on this national, national TAC and stakeholder groups uh, in the nursery landscape, uh, lumber, grape growers, wood and invasive species sectors. We are further organized into four subgroups. And so um, the federal agencies, as well as provincial and stakeholder groups, depending on uh, their particular priorities, we have members of most of these different agencies um, on these different, these four different subgroups. So I sit on the surveillance and the research advisory groups. Here in British Columbia, we have a plant protection advisory committee. I recently stepped in as chair for that committee in the last couple of months. Um, but in 2022, we formed a provincial spotted lanternfly technical advisory committee that I stepped up to chair. And my colleague here with Agriculture Canada, Hester Williams, is the secretary for that. Uh, we have members at the national level, um, uh, working in British Columbia from Agriculture Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the Canadian Forest Service, as well as um, entomologists and invasive plant, senior invasive plant specialists from the Ministry of Forest, the two provincial entomologists from BC Ministry of Agriculture, and the Invasive Species Council of BC. We have membership from them as well. About five minutes left. Thank you. So our primary focus so far, um, in addition to developing our mandate roles and responsibilities, has been to coordinate survey efforts for 2023, focusing again on these high-risk corridors, CFA preparing maps to identify key areas, and um, that's led by CFA, but supported by Agriculture Canada and BC Ministry of Agriculture. As well, we're working on how to harmonize communication and reporting as each agency has different ways that they, you know, collect data on invasive species detection, but we're very collaborative working together and any way to report spotted lanternfly is a good way. 
We also recently co-hosted a workshop with Canadian Food Inspection Agency here uh, in the Okanagan to look at how to deploy traps. So we were using the bug barriers, but also visual inspections and just getting together in the field. Uh, here we're with Tree of Heaven in a Tim Hortons parking lot. I was gonna crop out the coffee cup photo, but I thought you might appreciate that. Um, so that was a really great morning, just getting together uh, different agencies to talk about on the ground surveillance for spotted lanternfly. I had a small project funded last year by CFA to evaluate survey methods for early detection and monitoring. So we were just really getting out there in the field, deploying the circle trunk traps, developing time standards, and comparing that with visual inspections. Of course, we didn't find any spotted lanternfly, uh, mostly just earwigs. Some other research ongoing in Canada, um, likewise in the US, and there's healthy collaboration there, is looking for potential biological control agents for spotted lanternfly. My colleague, Dr. Tara Gariepi um, in Ontario, as well as uh, Tim Haya at CABI in Switzerland, have been looking at a couple of potential biological control agents. So far, not finding any that are host specific enough um, at this time, based on the current research for um, release, but further work is ongoing with these agents and to hopefully identify other agents that are suitably host specific for introduction into North America. My colleague, Dr. Amanda Rowe with the Canadian Forest Service has been looking at susceptibility um, of Canada's hardwood trees to spotted lanternfly. And she's been really focusing on cold tolerance work. And her research shows that eggs can survive and hatch after exposures to minus 20 degrees, uh, colder than earlier work. Um, and that wax removal and egg manipulation uh, impacts hatch rate. So she's really had to work on modifying those methods to make sure they're really accurate. Um, and she has sterile egg masses available within Canada for educational purposes. So her cold tolerance work is really being um, incorporated into modeling of the potential distribution for spotted lanternfly in Canada, which we think will be much more extensive than previously thought. Um, Amanda and myself, as well as Dr. Garapi, Dr. Williams, a few others, we've been looking um, further at susceptibility of Canada's native hardwood trees and shrubs particularly focusing at species of, at risk, as well as to indigenous culturally significant plant species, including many traditionally harvested berry species. So we've been working on developing um, a bit of an inventory of potential impacted plant species for Canada. And I'll spend my last one or two minutes just coming back to Tree of Heaven. So we were asked by the British Columbia Ministry of Forest and Base of Plant Program to begin to conduct research on the feasibility of a biological control program for Tree of Heaven independent um, of its association with spotted lanternfly. But while Dr. Williams and I were conducting this work, of course, we became aware of the very close association. Uh, here's the distribution um, of Tree of Heaven in North America as of last fall from a few different sources, very centered in Eastern North America, but we have this unfortunate corridor of Tree of Heaven um, coming up through California, Oregon, Washington State, and into British Columbia. When we look at the potential distribution um, of spot, or the current distribution of spotted lanternfly, uh, we know it's got a close association with Tree of Heaven and provides ongoing assistance um, in the spread, even though of course it's not the only host plant species and spotted lanternfly is able to develop in the absence of Tree of Heaven. Just flipping to the relevance for Canada here, the distribution of Tree of Heaven um, is quite extensive up into Southern Ontario, as well as the corridor that I mentioned in British Columbia's Okanagan Valley, where I work and where we have our primary grape growing uh, region. We've been working on development of biological control for Tree of Heaven since 2019, first focusing on a leaf curling um, aerophytid mite that's native to China and inventive in Europe. Um, our colleagues with CABI Switzerland and BBCA in Italy have been working on this for a number of years, as well as USDA scientists did detect this mite species is also present in France, and that was published, I believe, last year or maybe in late 2021. It's uh, highly damaging to young tree of heaven, heaven seedlings and can kill seedlings um, and arrest new growth. And we're still conducting host range testing on that, but it looks very promising. And the last thing that I'll mention here is there is a trunk boring weevil that has recently, as of um, 364 days ago, been recommended for release in the US. So it's still undergoing the last phases of the USDA technical advisory 
um, review prior to uh, approval for release, but it has been recommended for release. That work was led by Tom McAvoy and Scott Salem uh, from Virginia Tech with other US collaborators. Uh, but we're able to submit a Canadian petition as well for release of this agent into Canada, which we think would be a successful petition given it's a very host specific level with a very heavy impact on a large tree of heaven trees. With that, I'll stop there. And uh, as I said, any way to report spotted lanternfly in Canada is a good way, but there's the link to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency website, as well as CFA does have algorithms that monitor iNaturalist. So any reports on iNaturalist would also be successful. Awesome, thank you so much, Andra. A lot of great work up there. All right, I really want to invite the audience to put any questions you have for the speakers. And this can be Jessica LaBelle, Greg Halbrick, Kyle Berkey, Shandra Moffat, any questions for the speakers of this past session into the Q&A. Um, and while you do that, I did want to invite Cole, Cody Holthouse with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Cody, did you want to speak a little bit about Oregon? Yeah, sure. I can do kind of a brief, really brief little summary of what we've been up to. And yeah. again, thanks to all the speakers here. I've been just kind of a fly on the wall getting to kind of appreciate all the, the wisdom here. So thank you. Um, yeah, Oregon for the last, I think, two years, really. And last summer was my first summer with the ODA. So the only one I can really speak to has had a rail yard inspection going on. It's a PPA 7721 funded project that has selected 10 different rail yards with Union Pacific, BNSF, um, and I think one other rail uh, company. And we go and do visual inspections of boxcars, the actual track themselves at the rail yard, and uh, as much of the material there on the rail yard as we can. Um, as of now, I think we've done all the BNSF locations. We're still working on building a relationship uh, where we can get actual permission to get on Union Pacific property this summer. That's our goal. Um, but yeah, no reports as of yet, which is a good thing. Um, I do know before my time here as well, I think we had an interception either in a shipping container or a cargo container from an airplane. I can't remember which where we actually did intercept uh, SLF. Um, I think that was two, three years ago. So not in this distant past, it's pretty recent. Um, but yeah, no positive detections in the rail yard inspections that I've been a part of. We are going to do those again this year, another 10 sites. Um, and the only other project that's somewhat related has been a large massive survey that our weeds program here at the Oregon Department of Agriculture conducted in 2022 um, and I have a map of that I could show I don't know how much how uh, helpful that is I think it'll be pretty obvious kind of follows a lot of our highway corridors and human movement let's see here there we go if you can see that um, this gives you a little visual of the blue triangles where some of the efforts um, that some of my seasonal trappers have just while they're out looking for other insects, noted tree of heaven, the blue triangles, the pink triangles are eye naturalist uh, sightings that you just saw from the last presentation. And then we've got this other project, this weed mapper project um, that some of our friends in the weeds program have been working on. It's the green triangles there. So mostly following that I-5 corridor uh, and especially around the Portland PDX area there in the northwest portion of the state. And again, some more along the Columbia River, um, Deschutes River, and some of the other major corridors as you approach the eastern Oregon on the north border between that and Washington, as well as some in Jackson County there down by Medford in the southwestern part of the map. Um, but I, I think in a lot of ways, this is in its infancy. We have a lot more work to do, of course. Um, Tree of Heaven is fairly ubiquitous across many of our landscapes so yeah uh, that's a lot of what has gone on i know that matt travis was here earlier and um we have spoken with matt and i think about a month ago about creating a response plan and getting that off the ground right now we are in the midst of following through on some pretty epic japanese beetle and emerald ash borer battles but we're hoping that we can you know sit down and get some time to put a response plan together um it's on our to-do list 
and um, something that Chris Benneman, uh, my boss here at ODA, and I are working on getting prepared. So that's that's most of what I have. I don't know if there are any questions or things that other states nearby would like us to be looking for specifically, but that's what's going on in Oregon. All right. Thank you so much, Cody. Uh, speakers, if you have questions for each other, uh, you cannot use the Q&A, so you can raise your hand or just feel free to, to unmute and jump in. So let's see what I'd we like have. Selfishly ask another question while I'm here still. Yeah, of course. Uh, Chandra mentioned an algorithm that was used to um, find high naturalist sightings for, um, in this case, SLF, but we've been wanting to kind of do that generally. How did you set that up? How did you build that relationship with iNaturalist to do that? Yeah, it's um, my colleagues with Canadian Food Inspection Agency and Cody, I'd be happy to put you in touch. So if you can follow, we can get each other's emails. I'll put you in touch with them and uh, you guys can collaborate. That'd be great, thanks. Right. There is a comment that says um, you need to update the USDA plants database, Tree of Heaven, distribution map to add British Columbia. Unfortunately, we have a lot. Uh, there is a question for California. So this is for Kyle. Uh, have been reviewing your external quarantine a bit and wondering how businesses in states that aren't issuing permits or have compliance agreement requirements will be able to ship into California or even drive trucks into California. Are there exceptions or how does California handle this? Well, I don't, I don't work at the border, uh, so I can only answer this in a general sense, but uh, I mean, we have the ability to issue permits. And of course, you know, the way that we understand it now, it would involve a compliance agreement with the state. So I don't know if we have anything set up right now that would allow a business to independently, you know, uh, just get a permit without uh, without the involvement of the shipping state. You know, that's what I mean by compliance agreement. Um, so yeah, they're they're basically master permits, and the state would have some involvement. It's not that the it's not that the state has to do you know the training and all that, but they have some responsibility to make sure that they're carrying out the conditions of the permit. Um, but, you know, of course, we there there may be other situations. Uh, I don't think we've come across, across that yet, uh, where, you know, the, the, the whole point of permits is you tailor it for the situation. So, yeah, I mean, I can't rule out the possibility that we may issue permits in the future with uh, just individuals. Um, and if you're not doing business, it's just a you know, self uh, inspection checklist. Point that out. So, all right, thank you. Any other questions or speakers have questions for each other? All right. Well, I will share the code word for the Washington State Department of Agriculture Pesticide Recertification Credits. If you are seeking credits, uh, there have been two credits awarded if you have stayed the whole time. And in order to receive those credits, what I need is the code word in the chat, as well as your full name as it appears on the license and your license number. Oh, here's a Q&A. What do we do if the chat's disabled? That's a great question. <laughs> I thought I had enabled the chat. If if the chat is not working, please put it in the Q&A box. That is, that's fine too. I'm happy to take it there.
I wanted to thank everyone for attending today as well. Uh, I hope you feel inspired to keep your eyes peeled for this insect. Um, like many speakers have said, we really rely on you to in the public uh, to help spread the word. And so please not only watch out, you know, yourselves, but tell your friends and family to be on the lookout and report any possible sightings. Also, please consider reading the state action plan. We really value your feedback and are really looking to improve it. Uh, so we need your help in order to do that. I also wanted to thank all the wonderful speakers who volunteered their time today to present. Uh, it was phenomenal. I learned a whole bunch. And I really appreciate your time and willingness to participate. And we appreciate you and all of your hard work. Thank you, everyone.